Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am very excited about the next couple of speakers that we have on stage. Uh, we'll be starting off with a Q&A with Tom Khalil, who is the Deputy Director of Tech and Innovation um, at <laughs> the White House Office of Science and Tech Policy, uh, which is a very garbled way to say that he's very experienced in the very interesting intersection between science and technology and policy. But I will let you do your introduction. Who are you? Uh uh, so I uh, work for two different parts of the White House, the National Economic Council and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And for uh, OSTP, uh, I lead a team of 20 uh, policy entrepreneurs who come into work every day and try to answer questions like, what is the future of human space exploration? Or um, how do phenomena like learning and memory and perception emerge from the interaction of uh, 80 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses. Uh, how could we eliminate the uh, waiting list for uh, an organ transplant? Uh, how could we make computer science a new basic at the K through 12 level so that students are not just exposed to this uh, you know, at the undergraduate level? Uh, how do we increase the use of incentive prizes and other approaches to promoting innovation? Um, how do we make some changes to immigration policy so that it's easier for foreign entrepreneurs to come to the United States? Right. Um, what are the, in the same way that President Kennedy said, let's put a man on the moon and we decided to sequence the human genome, what are the similarly ambitious goals that we should be setting in the 21st century? And so once the members of my team have an, uh, have an idea or have a, people from outside of government bring us an idea, then they have a variety of different tools uh, that they can use to accelerate progress in that area. And that might include everything from working with Congress on legislation, um, the preparation of the president's budget, identifying things that the federal government can do through executive action that don't require legislation, um, using the uh, president's bully pulpit and his ability to convene to build coalitions that might not only include federal agencies, but research universities, companies, philanthropists and foundations, uh, nonprofit organizations, professional societies, uh, et cetera. Right, and I, I find this really exciting, and I expect many other people will as well, because so often I think people have this perception that working in government is this bureaucratic slog and that they're still operating on systems that are a century outdated. Um, and the, the kinds of things you're talking about are clearly cutting-edge research and, and top-notch projects. Yeah, so I think one, one thing uh, to keep in mind is that uh, the federal government is not uh, a monolithic organization uh, and that in fact there's a broad range of organizations and the extent to which uh, they are not only aware of uh, developments in science and technology but they're actually supporting them. Um, so uh, for example if you take out your iPhone and say where did the technologies in this iPhone uh, come from? Uh, well the transistors uh, are probably made using a process called uh, the FinFET, uh, which was developed on the Berkeley campus uh, with uh, government funding. Uh, GPS uh, came from the government. Uh, the internet is something that we started supporting in the, the late 1960s. Uh, Siri uh, came out of a government-funded project called Kalo, uh, uh, computer assistance that learn and organize. Uh, so not to take away anything from, uh, you know, Apple's really important work in, in integrating all those building blocks into a product that people covet. Uh, but if you look at a lot of the enabling technologies that were necessary to make that work, a lot of them come from government-sponsored uh, research, particularly at our leading research universities. Right, and that uh, sort of segues nicely into something that I find like very unique to your experience, that you don't seem to have just worked in the White House, but also have experience with UC Berkeley, which is why I imagine you brought that up, as well as um, interacting with them, <laughs> as well as uh, interacting with the private sector, too. Um, so why might you recommend uh, EAs look into policy in particular? Uh, well, uh I think that there are lots of opportunities to have a large impact in the government. Uh, and I'll give you uh, 
two stories. Uh, so one, something that I was involved in. So I also worked uh, for President Clinton in the 1990s, uh, as we say, during those dark days of peace and prosperity. Uh, but um, ar around uh, 97, 98, I started interacting with uh, scientists and engineers and uh, government uh, program managers who were interested in a field uh, called nanoscale science and engineering. Uh, and the observation was that when things get really small, when they get uh, smaller than 100 nanometers, not only are they small, but they start to exhibit new properties. Uh, and those could be new mechanical or optical or electrical or uh, mechanical properties. Uh, and so it's sort of the equivalent of adding another dimension to the periodic table of elements in terms of your ability to tune the properties of, uh, that emerge at, at the nanoscale. Um, so uh, this was actually a time when uh, the government started running budget surpluses. Uh, I know this is probably hard for you, uh, for the, uh, the recent college graduates in the room to imagine, but in the, in the late 90s, there was a lot of concern that we were like going to pay down the debt and like, like what was going to happen if there was no public debt anymore. So in that environment, uh, I was able to work with a, a group of federal agencies to propose a research initiative uh, that uh, President Clinton announced in a speech he gave uh, at Caltech. Uh, and he proposed roughly doubling the, the level of federal funding for uh, nanotechnology in a research uh, initiative called the National Nanotechnology Initiative. Um, and so since then, uh, that effort has survived the transition from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration to the Obama administration. I think it's highly likely that it would continue under uh, any administration. And it's resulted in a cumulative investment of $23 billion in federal R&D. Um, and what's more exciting uh, than the fact that we've invested a lot is things are coming out of this, right? So, uh, you know, it takes a long time because the usual time from discovery to manufacturing of a new material is 17 to 20 years. Um, but for example, uh, people are developing uh, functionalized nanoparticles that allow us to destroy cancerous tumors while leaving healthy cells untouched. Um, so uh, so th that's one story. It's like uh, working with the research community, uh, having them bring us an idea, and then having the President of the United States get behind it, uh, and then having a long-lasting research initiative which is beginning to have a transformative impact. And uh, then dozens of countries followed the United States and launched their own versions of this. So there's now a really robust uh, global research community. Another example um, from uh, a, uh, a, a young woman on my team, uh, Dr. Maya Shankar, uh, sent me an email that said, Cass Sunstein says I should work for you. Uh, and you uh, you're have an opportunity to hear Cass, but he for a, for a while was uh, at the Office of Management Budget uh, in the Obama White House and is a leader in the field of behavioral economics, wrote a book with uh, Richard Thaler called uh, Nudge, which helped popularize a lot of these I ideas about cognitive biases that, that people have and suggesting that there are opportunities to improve public policy. So one example is that you can get people to save more if you change the default on your IRA uh, from opt-in to opt-out. That is, you're automatically enrolled in your company IRA uh, unless you call up HR and say, please take me out. And so just that move can have an increase in the savings rate. Uh, and so she was very excited about finding those ideas and applying them to uh, federal uh, policy and, and practice. Um, and so even though she was only in her late 20s, in a very short period of time, she has been able to stand up uh, an organization called the Social and Behavioral Sciences Team, uh, recruit 20 behavioral scientists to the federal government. Um, she now has a waiting list of over 500 people that would like to join her team. Uh, she convinced uh, President Obama to sign an executive order institutionalizing this effort into future administrations, um, and now has over 60 collaborations with federal departments and agencies that are not only 
uh, using these insights, but then doing randomized controlled trials to make sure that they actually work. Um, so, you know, people have this notion of uh, the government being dysfunctional, and that's uh, that's because that when you have a Congress and an executive branch um, that are controlled by different parties, uh, and you have increased polarization of American politics, which is something that we're dealing with right now, that things that require groundbreaking legislation, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, or the interstate highway system in the, in the late 1950s, or overhauling our immigration uh, laws, uh, there are a lot of important things that are not happening. Uh, because of the difficulty of getting consensus between the two political parties. Mm -hmm. But that is not to say that there's not a lot of important or exciting things that are, that are currently happening uh, in, in the area of, of, uh, of public policy. I certainly have more questions for you, but I want to make sure the audience can also ask a couple of questions. So if you don't mind switching to the next slide, uh, you can submit questions to that link above, and I'll read a couple of, off of my phone if they're highly rated. Um, yeah, so I, I'm very uh, excited by the couple of examples that you posed, especially the latter one with um, your researcher, um, Maya, I forgot her last uh, name. Shankar. Yeah. Shankar, yeah. yes. Um, because she was so young. Um, and it, I think a lot of people have the sense that you can't make a difference in policy or in some other uh, public servant position until they're in their 40s or 50s, by which time the, the kinds of things that they might want to do have changed substantially. Um, I, what would you look for in a person who's in their 20s or 30s and looking to get into the policy space? How can they make their name and do something really impactful early on? Well, I think it, it helps if they have something that they're really excited about working on. So she didn't just send me an email and saying, oh, I'd like to work for the government. She said, the British have created something called the Behavioral Insights Team, and uh, I think that there should be something like that in the United States as well. So having a hypothesis of the dent that you want to put in the universe is very useful. Um, th this was something that she was like intrinsically motivated uh, to work on. Uh, and um, I think other, some other attributes are, in a lot of cases, you have to be good at building coalitions. Uh, I mean, it's not like she did this by herself. Uh, she was successful because she identified people in the federal government that were willing to try this out, um, uh, university research centers that were willing to uh, send academic researchers to the federal government, uh, foundations that were willing to support this work. Um, so the ability to have influence without authority uh, is really important in these positions. And then patience. Um, you know, there are a lot of instances where she will have a conversation with an agency about trying something out um, and it will, uh, you know, take a while to get them on board. Uh, right. And so it, it's not like, you know, the federal government is like a 10-person startup where they can right. get together in the morning and say, okay, we're going to do this, right? Uh, there are lots of checks and balances. Uh, and uh, that's how our founding fathers set it up. <laughs> uh, so they didn't set it up so there's like, like one person who could, you know, unilaterally make lots of decisions. Uh, so there's also a certain amount of patience and a willingness to think about uh, the long term and, and not having this view of, oh, you know, I tried to do this and people didn't say yes right away. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of our sayings is water on stone, right? <laughs> like so, so sometimes it takes a while to wear people down and, and eventually get them to say yes. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it seems definitely um, being patient, but you seem to be particularly well leveraged to make things happen as you have a, a d direct line of communication with the president. Um, and it seems that one of the things you've been able to do with this direct line is create a, a series of grand challenges, uh, mm -hmm. bring up some of the most important issues in the 21st century, um, many of which seem very aligned with the kinds of things that EAs are paying attention to. Uh, would you mind explaining some of the ones that you're particularly excited about? Sure. So uh, one of the ones that I've been uh, working with on our uh, with our next speaker, uh, Jason Matheny, is the President's Brain Initiative, uh, which he, he announced in April 2013. Um, and uh, the goal of the Brain Initiative is to dramatically increase our understanding of how the brain encodes and processes information. Um, and uh, our hope is that that will not only lead to fundamental uh, understanding of how the brain works, 
but also improve our ability to diagnose, treat, and prevent diseases of the brain. Um, and Alzheimer's alone could cost the United States a trillion dollars a year by 2050. So if you think research is expensive, uh, it's going to be far more expensive if we don't do something to uh, improve our ability to treat or prevent uh, or diagnose uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Our hope is also that um, this will lead to technological benefits. So some of the supercomputers that we're working on building, uh, if we did nothing to make them more energy efficient, would require 200 megawatts of energy. So imagine a, a, every computer would have to have their own dedicated power plant. Uh, the human brain uh, uses 20 watts. Uh, so clearly Mother Nature has uh, learned something about lower, low power computation uh, that, that we would like to learn from. Um, so uh, that is an effort that involved uh, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, uh, DARPA, which is the agency that uh, helped develop the internet, uh, and IARPA, which is the organization that uh, uh, Jason runs, and also uh, the Department of Energy and the uh, Food and Drug Administration are the agencies that are participating in this. And we also have lots of philanthropists, foundations, uh, companies, and research universities that are also investing. So by the end of this year, we believe that between what the government is doing and what the private sector is doing, we'll have invested a billion and a half dollars uh, in, uh, in supporting the President's Brain Initiative. That's really exciting. Um, I'm going to jump to a couple of audience questions. Great. So uh, we have so many coming in, my phone keeps on wanting to reload them all. Um, yeah, we had a question here. Yeah, science has less credibility than ever in the United States. People don't believe in climate change. How can offices like yours change that and expand the interest in EA findings? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think that, uh, you know, what in the area of climate change, I think that uh, w one of the things that we can point to now is not just, oh, this is something that's going to happen in like 2050, uh, but this is something that is happening right now and we're already be beginning to see uh, adverse consequences associated with this. I think one of the things that it's going to require is that uh, more uh, scientists and engineers become what some people have called civic scientists, that is, that part of their responsibility is not just to talk to each other, but to mm -hmm. talk to the public. Um, and that requires that uh, they uh, get the training to do that. So there's some places like uh, Alan Alda has an institute, uh, which is all about uh, increasing the ability of scientists and engineers to communicate with the public. Um, so you know, I don't think that's going to totally solve the problem, uh, because I think there's some more deep-rooted uh, reasons why you know some people are processing information in, in particular ways. I also think that you need to look for um, a broader set of allies. So for example, at, at one point there were a number of religious organizations that said, well, we think there's actually some linkages between environmental goals and uh, you know commandments in the Bible for us to be good stewards of the planet. Um, and so, you know, looking for ways to broaden the coalition of individuals and organizations uh, that are concerned about these issues is, is also very important. Yeah, and you had um, mentioned to me earlier, actually, that you were uh, interested in not just having people working directly in, say, the White House on policy, but just developing skills to interact with policy makers. Uh, what kinds of activities could people partake in to interact with policy, if not in the government directly? Yeah, so, well, first of all, a lot of the things that we do involve external collaborations. So uh, the president has a goal of preparing 100,000 high quality math and science teachers over the next 10 years. Uh, and so there is an organization called 100K and 10 uh, that has built a coalition of 250 organizations that are either making financial or, or in-kind commitments to help achieve that. So there's a lot of instances where uh, we're partnering or working closely with an external organization in order to achieve a particular goal. Um, I think that in terms of uh, influencing policy, uh, if you were 
an entrepreneur, you wouldn't approach an angel investor or venture capitalist without having some understanding about how they make decisions right. um, and what it is that they're looking for and what criteria they're going to use in order to make a decision about whether or not to fund you. Uh, and so similarly, if uh, you're going to try to shape policy, uh, you have to have some understanding of, of how it is that uh, the government works and makes decisions and figure out who is the right person for you to be talking to. Um, and so all those things are, are you know, require a, an investment of time. The other thing is that policy is about trying to create some sort of coherent relationship between ends and means. So you have some goal that you're trying to achieve and there's some set of public and private actions that you will think will move us in the right direction. So the thought experiment that I pose to the members of my team is that you have a magic laptop. And the power of the laptop is, is that any press release that you write will come true. Uh, and what you have to do is to come up with a headline, which is a goal statement, several paragraphs that provide context, and paragraph level descriptions of who is agreeing to do what in order to achieve the goal. And then once you understand uh, what is the coalition that you need to build, you can begin to understand, well, what would it take for this, uh, this set of actors to actually take the action that I believe that they should take? And what is the evidence? What are the arguments that I can marshal in order to persuade them that they should think about doing this? It sounds very pragmatic. <laughs> and definitely thinks, I think it sounds a lot more tractable than so many people have this perception, again, that uh, you, you can't get people to do things in government because everybody has a very narrow interest. But even if they do have narrow interests, you seem to be suggesting you may very well be able to get them to do something if you just frame it in the right way or offer them the right thing. Uh, yeah, or, or that it, 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 you know, it's depending on the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, so. Uh, some problems are complicated enough so that there's no single uh, organization that is in a position to solve them. Right. Um, and if that is the position that you're in, uh, you are probably going to have to get the attention of leadership because it's difficult for uh, large scale uh, multi-agency or public-private partnerships to sort of come together organically. Um, it is easier if the situation that you're dealing with is more of a rifle shot issue. That is that there's some individual organization that if they decided to, uh, they could actually do the thing that you think needs to get done. Yeah, yep, that makes sense. Um, I got a couple of questions from people asking more about credentialing, what exactly it takes to work for OSTP or some other organization that's in a similar space, some other agency in a similar space. Do people need PhDs? Do they just need to demonstrate competence? Uh, so we have lots of PhDs, uh, but we also have people who uh, have you know, different backgrounds, and it sort of depends on what it is that they want to work on. Uh, so as I said, um, you know, what I look for is not just formal credentials, but uh, some sort of track record uh, about you know, what it is that they've been able to accomplish in the past, um, whether, uh, uh, and, and whether I think they're gonna have some of the broader skills, not just technical skills, uh, but like coalition building, uh, negotiation, ability to communicate with multiple audiences, uh, influence without authority that is uh, necessary to be a, a effective uh, in the White House. Great, and it sounds like the kinds of skills people would want to develop regardless of whether or not they were going into policy. So yeah, uh, no, it seems absolutely. very plausible to me. You develop those skills and then decide to work in government a few years later. Yep. Okay, um, I think we're running close on time. I'll choose one more question. Um, oh, how do you think OSTP will change in the next administration? Uh, well, I think uh, without uh, commenting on the election, uh, which we're not <laughs> supposed to do. Uh, I would say that uh, w one of the things about science policy relative to other areas of public policy is that it is less partisan. So that's not, uh, that is not to say that there are not differences between the, between the parties, uh, but uh, there are areas of uh, you know, broad 
uh, bipartisan agreement that cancer is a bad thing, for example. Um, and so uh, there are uh, lots of areas where it is, it is, uh, it is not as politically charged uh, as some other areas. Now that is not universally true. Uh, you know, one of your the earlier question talked about climate change, uh, uh, where there are differences between the between the parties. But I think that relative to other areas, uh, there are sort of less swings back and forth depending on on who's in power. I think there, depending on the president, there can be differences in the extent to which the president is personally interested in these issues. So one of the things that we have benefited from is President Obama just thinks this stuff is cool. Uh, and so uh, one of the decisions he made early on is he said, you know, if you win the Super Bowl uh, or the NCAA, you get to come to the White House. The same thing should be true if you win a robotics competition or a science fair. So he decided to put, um, start holding a, uh, a science fair every year and uh, invite uh, all these uh, amazing uh, young people who had participated in a science fair or uh, robotics competition or, or something like that. And then we also had a Baker Fair in the White House and uh, we actually got an 18 uh, foot robotic giraffe from Burning Man on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the South Lawn of the White House. So we've been very <laughs> blessed in terms of like the president's interest in these issues and then that empowers us to give him lots of ideas for things that he should consider, uh, which he can then say, yes, I want to get behind this, or I want to talk about this in the State of the Union, or I really want to make this a priority. So there can be some differences in the extent to which uh, a president is just into these issues. Well, I'm very excited about the work you do, and certainly we'll follow up with you for that photograph, Great. the giraffe on the lawn. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're going to have to conclude this, but thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah.